Hello, I'm Paul Connolly. This is the fifth edition of Connolly Network Insights Video Updates. Welcome. This edition, I'm going to look at uh, things that have caught my eye during the month of January in the consumer networking space, and particularly with regards to video. So I have six topics that I'm going to cover uh, during this uh, session. The first of, uh, topic is Netflix. And Netflix have taken three positive steps, in my opinion, uh, during the month to improve their uh, business model, uh, which for those of you who have followed my research, I uh, will know that uh, I'm not a particular fan of the model they're running because I don't see that it uh, provides them long-term viability um, as competition increases and the cost of content continually goes up and uh, the number of consumers that they have uh, as customers eventually reaches a limit. So the first thing they did was to hire a new CFO, uh, an, an experienced uh, person who came in and, and has an explicit goal of, among other things, improving their operating margins, which are extremely low. They're also extremely uh, cash flow negative, even though they've been, business, uh, been in business for uh, a number of years. Uh, the second thing that they did, uh, the most significant thing, is to raise their prices. So this is the fourth time they've raised their prices. They actually put the, uh, the most popular service up by almost 20%. Uh, and I think that's a very positive step. When Netflix began, they were an aggregator of content. Streaming had a lot of technical issues. The devices weren't as solid. The networks weren't as solid. And they set a price point that, uh, that reflected all of that. Now they've significantly changed their model. They, they are known for their original content and they're generating more and more of it. Uh, the networks are running better, the devices are better, and yet the price point, even though they've had four uh, price increases, is still, in my opinion, pretty low for the value it brings. So the most significant thing to watch in the future is uh, where the price elasticity is. My, my own opinion is most people will accept this price increase and they won't see a particularly uh, huge customer drop. And in fact, I think they can probably continue to push it uh, over the next couple of years. But if they can't, uh, I, don't, I just don't see how they improve their uh, operating margins and hence their long-term viability to generate the kind of earnings that the stock is priced uh, to deliver. And so, uh, so time will tell, but that'll be very interesting to watch. The third thing that they did was uh, they acquired rights to two very, very high profile uh, concerts uh, that uh, customers were attending live and paying literally thousands of dollars to see. Uh, the first being Bruce Springsteen's Broadway show, which just ended, and the second uh, Taylor Swift's Redemption Tour that, uh, that was filmed for this particular um, video in Dallas. Um, and they have exclusive rights. It's not clear uh, for how long. Uh, the terms were supposedly $20 million plus for Bruce Springsteen and undetermined for the Taylor Swift concert. But the interesting thing here is they don't have to go through the long cycle of having original content produced and wait for some long period before they see the positive impact on it. Now, because they're all subscription-based, the only way they see an impact is either through customer retention or customer addition. So it's a little bit hard to measure, but, uh, but in my mind, very, very positive. I've got to say, having watched the Springsteen video, uh, very, very solid, and that uh, alone was worth, in my opinion, a few months worth of Netflix subscription. So, um, so they also released their fourth quarter earnings. Um, I won't talk about it here because I'm going to put another video out shortly that will uh, give you my views on all the uh, earnings results fourth quarter of the, the, all the major players in the video space and, and uh, some of the other areas of consumer networking, wireless, etc. And uh, that'll come out shortly. So, but, uh, but as far as networks flicks goes, positive steps. Um, interestingly, you know, Disney's the only one that's really coming at them. Uh, very explicitly and very publicly stating they're already going to pull their content off, they're going to uh, match or beat their price, they're going to roll out all kinds of new original content. Uh, the other players are kind of uh, hedging their bets. Uh, AT&T, for example, just renewed a deal with Netflix uh, to put Friends on for the next two years. 
uh, reputedly for $150 million, but they also kept the rights to roll it out on their own streaming service. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to be messy going forward in terms of content owners and how the content owners decide they want to roll their content out, whether it be of their own distribution or, or uh, competitors' distribution. So there's going to be a lot of frenemies and, uh, and time will tell what the optimal um, method of maximizing the value of original content will be. But uh, so for right now, I'm a little more positive on Netflix because of those steps. The second topic I'd like to review is Apple's pre-announcement of a miss in revenues and earnings. A pretty significant event drew a lot of uh, media attention because it's the first time it happened in quite a long time. So, so what's really going on here? Well, with the smartphone market maturing, uh, less and less new people to pull into particularly sophisticated high-end smartphones, and people extending their uh, replacement cycle, the market had become very flat. Apple's strategy in the face of this, particularly for a product that represented almost two-thirds of their revenues, uh, was to do two things. One, they uh, significantly drove up the ASP, uh, and they were quite successful at doing that in the, in the previous quarter, actually driving the ASPs up uh, across the base uh, by over $200. And secondly, they focus more and more on services and, and mining the value of that installed base by rolling out more and more uh, services to users in that base. So that had been their strategy. Now they had to pre-announce uh, uh, a miss on the volume side. And they attributed much of it to China. Now, if you recall, Samsung basically got taken out of the market in China uh, because of the same kind of issue. I mean, local... Chinese manufacturers, very sophisticated uh, capabilities, uh, and lower costs. And so uh, Samsung had already been squeezed out, and I think that was starting to happen to Apple. The interesting thing is the product that really got hit the most was apparently the, the 10R, the lower featured, lower cost of the new iPhones that had been rolling out. And that's because I think the people that will really spend the high-end premium price are the you know, the Apple uh, uh, lovers who want the latest and greatest. One of the other mitigating effects in China is the, uh, the high use of the WeChat app. So many users in China get onto WeChat in the morning and they use it all day long for all kinds of, of uh, uses. And hence, whether you're on iOS or Android, the app works more or less the same. So the, so the unique functionality of the iPhone in China uh, kind of got taken away. So, um, so what have they done about it? Um, a couple of very significant things. Number one, on the services side, they decided to um, roll out services beyond the iOS base. You know, they have 1.4 billion uh, iOS active devices uh, out in the worldwide. So a very large base to pl pull from. But they decided for the first time to roll out um, iTunes onto the new Samsung, new generation of Samsung uh, smart TVs. And they also decided to roll out Apple Music onto Alexa-based uh, devices with Amazon. And so uh, Apple have always been able to keep control and hence uh, build a good user experience because it was a closed system. Uh, unlike Android that has a hundred different versions with each manufacturer putting their own little uh, tweak on the system. So this is a big step for Apple, but I think services become more and more uh, valuable to them and hence something that they really needed. The third topic I'd like to talk about is Verizon and uh, kind of the end of their strategy to uh, focus on um, video-based millennial ads. So Verizon, uh, in stark contrast to AT&T, decided some time ago that they would try and take Google and uh, Facebook head-on to the digital advertising space by assembling their own base of billion-plus user services uh, and then trying to roll out significant digital ads, which were growing pretty rapidly at the time. Uh, they were successful in acquiring the large user base. They bought AOL 
Then they bought Yahoo and they assembled a number of services that had uh, a billion plus users. Uh, they also acquired a programmatic ad capability, but they were not able to launch uh, a significant campaign to acquire a major share in the digital advertising space. They um, um, launched a service called Go90, which was meant to be a millennial-focused uh, ad-based service and uh, spent uh, a billion and a half plus on it and then quietly folded it when they couldn't really build any volume. Uh, they've had a number of changes. Tim Armstrong, the original AOL executive, left. Um, they rolled everything together into a new system called Oath. Now they've changed that back to Verizon uh, Media Services. And they've just recently taken a $4 billion write down on those investments. So uh, it's clear to me that Verizon is refocusing back on their wireless business. Um, they intend to lead in the 5G space. Um, their CEO is a wireless executive. And, uh, and I think they're really going to run hard uh, to be the premier wireless player uh, and not focus on these other uh, issues such as, as uh, video content. Uh, a, a number of the other digital media companies on a smaller scale also seem to be suffering. Uh, Verizon cut 7% of their uh, workforce in, the, uh, in that area. And uh, we're also seeing BuzzFeed, Vice, um, and some of the other smaller players all cutting staff. They're, they're finding a very difficult time to generate significant uh, volumes of digital ads because of the dominance of Google and Facebook, which in, in spite of all the pressures on, on um, privacy and, and fake news and so on, continue to thrive and, and hold uh, two thirds of the marketplace, leaving the other third for all other players. So I think you see the, the basically the, the end of that focus of Verizon on, on trying to be a video player and, uh, and thrive in that environment. And now they're kind of retrenching back into being uh, the number one wireless player. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how that impacts uh, AT&T and, and Sprint and T-Mobile. The fourth item I'd like to talk about is the uh, raising of the price of their service by uh, Fubo TV, who is one of the um, the skinny bundle or virtual uh, MVPD players, and uh, they're about the last of the players to raise their price. Now it's kind of interesting when you look at how these skinny bundles came about. The existing pay TV operators, from the largest, um, you know, Direct TV and Comcast on down, have been uh, complaining for some time about the high cost of video content, and hence the low relative margin uh, of video compared to uh, their data service. Um, and so the result was some players said, hey, I'm going to roll out a, a virtual pay TV system. I'm going to strip away some of the content that nobody really wants. I'm going to deliver it over the internet and I'm going to charge a relatively uh, lower price uh, for that subset of content. And I think what everybody's finding is they started out saying the first question is, what is a minimal subset that you need? And it turns out, you know, everybody has different tastes and people want different things. And then uh, secondly, how much does it cost you to deliver it? And uh, so everybody started out with, you know, somewhere between 40, 60, 70 channels. Um, and they all went through, whether it be uh, Sling or DirecTV Now or YouTube, um, the whole um, uh, group of them have all basically had to cry uncle on uh, low or non-existent margins and start to raise their price. So we're kind of back to this notion that um, a la carte TV is not quite as simple as, as people might think. And so, uh, so I think it raises the whole issue of the value of content, how content should be put together, uh, how do the owners of the content maximize the value of it by picking which distributor they use, and ultimately what the, the public, who, who have really the only vote in terms of what they buy, are willing to uh, spend their money on. So I think uh, this whole skinny bundle market is, uh, is definitely having a bit of a rough ride, and um, it'll be interesting to see who's got the staying power uh, or how it will evolve. Um, you contrast that with uh, 
Disney rolls out a non ESPN sports kind of offering, the content that's not uh, important or, or uh, major on ESPN, which is still a significant cash cow, even though they're losing users. Uh, and they roll out ESPN Plus with, with more minor sports, niche areas. Now they've got a big push with uh, Ultimate Fighting. And they build up over 2 million users um, within one year. So now it's, it's priced at $4.99, so it's pretty low. But So I think there are niches that can play. Uh, but this whole notion of how do I transform pay TV from the existing infrastructure where every analyst is crying the sky is falling to a, an internet delivered service, uh, more personalized, more a la carte, but one that keeps the providers of the service and the providers of the content that feeds the service with uh, long-term viability. So I think a lots of evolution still to go. I'd keep a close eye on these virtual uh, pay TV operators uh, because something's got to give. I mean, they're clearly uh, not going to make it um, with the offering and the price point that they've got. The fifth item that caught my eye was uh, Roku becoming more and more of a software-based company and now trying to be an integrator uh, in a deeper sense than just um, allowing you to pass through their system to provide other uh, services under their umbrella. So if you'll recall, Roku was actually originally part of Netflix and was spun out of Netflix uh, because consumer hardware is very difficult uh, to make any money. And so Roku uh, is still the number one provider of uh, IP video devices in the homes and they got some heavy competition from from Amazon, from Google, from Apple. Uh, but they they are shifting more and more towards making money from software rather than from the hardware where the margins have to be very, very low. Uh, they built up a pretty substantial base, I think about 27 million people that are using this Roku channel that gets them access to uh, to various types of content, mostly ad-based uh, content. But now they've said that you can take other premium content and buy it through their system like a uh, kind of like an app store um, where they will integrate the billing and the the uh, the sign up and so on. So a little bit like what uh, Amazon is doing with its channels program. So so again, uh, I think a smaller player trying to say, how do I survive? Uh, clearly can't make it as a hardware only based uh, um, company in this low margin business. So let's try and carve out a unique position. Not clear whether they'll survive um, Apple and Amazon as being the integrators of other channels, but, uh, but I give them kind of A for effort for, uh, for trying to be innovative and trying to get a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, the last issue is two interesting new um, streaming players coming up uh, in 2020. Uh, first of all, NBC Universal uh, announced that they would launch a, uh, a streaming product, but they took a very, very conservative approach, saying that it would be uh, it would be an ad-based capability, not initially at least subscription. It would be provided free to all of the existing. Uh, NBC and Sky customers of 50 some million uh, customers that uh, that uh, use their pay TV service. And uh, so it kind of came across as a very much, uh, we're not sure we want to do this. We know we have to get in the game, but it certainly doesn't look yet like the product that's going to compete uh, with Netflix and, uh, and Disney. So, you know, and, and again, it's back to people have their existing business to protect they have to make the transition. You generally lose money during the transition, and if you get the if you're too aggressive on the timing, it uh, it hurts you uh, big time. If you're too late on the timing, you don't build share and you miss out. So, so a lot of these companies are facing this balancing act between uh, when do I want to make a shift towards an all stream IP based network and when do I want to protect the significant assets I've got. So it looks like Disney has come out clear on the aggressive side, Comcast coming out on the uh, conservative side, and I think AT&T uh, coming out somewhere uh, in the middle. You know, AT&T have the most to lose because they're getting clobbered with their uh, DirecTV satellite business, 
and they've got to get all the, that huge number of customers off of that system. Uh, so they're, we're working out various flavors of DirecTV now from free for high-end wireless users to, uh, to a big bundle that would be equivalent to a complete pay TV offering um, and a bunch of flavors in between. So, so they have no choice. They have to make this transition happen. As I've said earlier, I think they're really trying hard to, to take the content which uh, consumers uh, already ex uh, expect to have advertising, the traditional pay TV content, and dramatically improve the value of that um, uh, consumer uh, access by providing targeted ads that have significantly higher uh, revenue per ad. So they're working hard on getting that whole capability in place and hence shifting the value away from subscription and more towards advertising. Um, by improving by three or four or five x the value of the ads, so uh, so interesting to see how they make out with that. It's not an easy undertaking, but the volume of pay TV ads is still uh, seventy billion dollars for video ads. So it's a big big market um, that they're they're looking at uh, optimizing. So they'll be a very interesting one to follow. The second of the uh, the two new streaming services that caught my eye had already been announced uh, some time ago with Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, launching this video, um, mobile-only, short video ad-based offering uh, primarily aimed at millennials, which sounds a little bit like uh, Go90, but uh, the difference is he's got a billion dollars worth of investment from all the major studios. And when that was first announced, I kind of scratched my head saying, you know, everybody's jumping in from Disney to Alibaba to uh, NBC Universal. I mean, Warner Brothers, all these people are all jumping in. And I couldn't quite understand. It looks like a pretty risky undertaking. Some very A-list players. I mean, Meg, Whit Meg Whitman being the COO. And, um, and now a little bit more detail was shared that it turns out the company itself is going to, for the people that are producing the content, completely underwrite the production costs. So the studios, I mean, if they, if they get in as an investor, then clearly they're risking that money. But on an ongoing basis, to deliver content via that channel, they don't have to endure the, co the content costs. That comes from uh, this service, which is now called um, uh, Quibi. Quibi, I think, is the name of it. It'll launch in 2020. Uh, and what they've said is they won't continue to hold exclusivity on that content for which they paid all the production rights uh, forever, but will basically turn that uh, um, content right back over to the studio at some point that produced it. So that made a lot more sense in terms of why people would be interested in jumping in on this thing. Uh, if it does become successful, then it certainly makes the terms uh, much more amenable for the A-list directors and studio heads, et cetera, that are, that are committed to making this short-form, millennial-based mobile content. So that'll be an interesting one to keep an eye on in 2020 as well. So that's it for this edition of uh, Conley Network Insights. I hope you've enjoyed uh, what I've told you. Um, as I mentioned a little earlier, I'll be putting uh, the next video out uh, shortly with my take on the fourth quarter results for all of the players uh, that we've been discussing. Uh, take care, and I will talk to you soon.